In the culture war, there are no winners, just podcasters. Only a few are willing to risk their lives in the face of some of the dumbest ideas to have ever captured human civilization. Every week, we, Megan Dom and Sarah Hader, humbly accept this mission in order to bring you conversations that are equal parts stunning, brave, and unhinged. Welcome to a special place in hell. Oh, Sarah, not the, uh, it's not the conversation that I anticipated having this week. No. Uh, thought we no. would just go back to talking about our usual, uh, you know, institutions In bad. Yeah, sure. Women bad. Women bad. Uh, what, is that so much to ask that we can just talk about women bad? Uh, no, but unfortunately, this uh, this the weekend has been horrible. The news has been awful. I've tried to disengage. I've tried to stay away from Twitter and failed. Um, and it is just nasty out there. Um, tons of trolls talking about uh, the, you know, the horrific um, kidnappings, murder, you know, torture of of Israeli citizens. Um Civilians. I mean, it's unlike anything. And, and initially, like, you know, the 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 phrase, this is Israel's 9-11 was a powerful phrase. And then you realize it's just exponentially worse than that because proportionate to the population. What is it? Not nine million. What's the population of Israel? Like, yeah, it's small. And it's, then it's, on, on top of that, it's it's so much more personal because they broke yeah. into homes, you know, like it wasn't, they targeted one prominent building somewhere that had a high casualty rate. It was that they broke into your house. Yeah. And, and babies your kids. And, and children and kidnapping and like in front of parent, par I mean, just torturing families in front yeah. of one another. It's, yeah. it's unimaginable. It was inhumane in a way, like barbaric in a way that even I don't think 9-11 was, you know, 9-11 no, I mean, was the building collapsed and killed that many people. And people jumping off of the building, off of the roof of the, people jumping out of the windows of the World Trade Center were extremely, that was kind of, that was right, where it right. really, that was the, that was the shocking barbarism. But this is a, a totally different thing. Going into people's homes you know, terrorizing children, hurting children, hurting babies. I mean, that's another, that's just, I don't even have an a, a, a inhumane beyond, um, you know, it, words do fail me. I have no, I have no other way of, um, of describing the situation or how it made me feel. And what was horrifying about it was really the response. I, guess I am naive. And to some degree, I still hold that our politics are not that, that screwed up and expected to see only an outpouring of support, you know, only just at least clear, for the moment, at least for at the least weekend, for five minutes, for right. five minutes, right. right. For five minutes, have some pity on the families who have just been you know, brutalized in this way for five minutes. And turns out that was too much to hope for. And I was, you know, really shocked at the kinds of callous remarks I saw on Twitter um, and the the inability of even, you know, of AOC, you know, to just just condemn it. You know, instead of saying that we condemn it, but also ceasefire, like that's ple violence is never the answer, but also we oppose Israel, and also we would like to call for for an end to to the violence and to and a ceasefire. So they just got attacked. They just got attacked. What are you talking about, ceasefire? It's yeah, and then it's it was what was really. And I think more than anything, it's hard to say more than anything, but the response from young people, it's, I guess we've known this, but it's never been more clear to me until now that there are entire generations coming up that really don't understand anything about this conflict other than free Palestine as a, as a meme, essentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And it, th this has just gotten swept up into sort of larger social justice umbrella yeah. and people have absolutely 
no understanding of the details or the history and like the the politics aside like let's just put that aside for a second the the utter cluelessness combined with the like astonishing callousness i don't think i've ever seen anything like that in my lifetime as as a cultural phenomenon i don't have to know anything about the conflict to feel that you know, parachuters going into a festival and kidnapping and murdering a bunch of people is a terrible thing. And then I saw a tweet by uh, BLM Chicago. I don't think they've deleted it, you know, as of yet, it's been up for a while where they, it was just kind of a, like a memefied version of, of like a parachuter. Mm -hmm. Um, And it said, I think it said free Palestine on it or some kind of like support message um it was grotesque yeah. it was just simply grotesque like that's te- that's that's terrorism that's in those are innocent people yeah and you know? it had this sort of aesthetic of a uh, kind of liberation poster like it wasn't even it had this kind of cute sort of um grassroots kind of like um in this house we believe sort of style yeah, to it yeah, yeah um and uh yeah i mean i've and it's been picked up by other institutions uh, you know cal state long beach uh has a now a students united against apartheid poster making for the protest of palestine uh event and so and they are um borrowing this parachuter imagery i mean uh, immediately afterwards uh, there were yeah. all these protests for what like, what yeah. are you, you know, what just, what are you talking, they haven't, Israel hadn't retaliated at that point. So what are you, pro? like, it, it was as if, it was as if the attack gave them a wind, you know, beneath their wings. And now is the time to really say that we, we need a free Palestine and we demand it. But you can only say that if you feel as if what happened was in line with you know it, that 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 this is one message to some to some and degree that, and that they had no other choice that this is a people yeah. who are so desperate and They're, have yeah. been a, yeah. oppressed so maximally that they had absolutely no choice that this was a this was a desperate measure and again it's just I, I, the misinformation i mean frankly like i i find it confusing you know right. the open air prison camp um, phrasing, like I find myself Googling, like that was the main thing is I found myself horrified and then just frantically Googling, trying to figure out what is true. How much of this is true? Is this 80% accurate? 10%, 0%. I think that like everybody's, well, anybody who is bothering to try to find out is like sort of in the middle of that kind of thing. But I mean, here's what I I, and I'm, I really am curious what you think about this, because, I mean, the most sort of the, the broadest and kind of just more basic framing to me is like this 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 intersectional framework, this kind of social justice framework that is all about decolonization and white supremacy and an obsession, frankly, with skin color is what is driving this. I mean, it's it is pigment and power. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so in their minds, if you were born in 1990, well, you were probably born in 1990. I don't if, in their minds, whoever has the lighter skin is the oppressor. Yeah. And that's the end of the story. Yeah. And in this case and in this case, if you also have some power in society, then even more so. Uh, and and that's where it ends. It is an incredibly childish way to look at power relations. And, you know, I've we've talked some of it is because they are literally children some of it is because they have not you know they've not transitioned into parenthood they're still stuck in this like 20 year long adolescence in which they're just rebelling against their parents parents think this too continuously right right i mean but this is some this is to you know it's just become the the ethos of the political left um, and I, they're not even interested in getting to the root of what's going on. Um, part of the reason, so I have not been super involved in this conflict. I don't tweet about it, talk about it up until, you know, this weekend. I just don't really engage with it very much. And, you know, there's several reasons as to why. It's just that, 
you know, I'm a humanitarian. The reason I pay attention to global conflicts is often for humanitarian reasons. But, but it, it, you know, when you look at the scale, even even including what happened, not to make light of it, but to say that out of the the, the greatest wounds in the world are not, you know, at Israel Palestine. Like there's just there's just so much bloodshed happening everywhere. So if that's if loss of human life is your standard you really these politics shouldn't really matter to you. Israel Palestine should not be the top of your list. It should it it, it actually belongs on a you know, a, you know top 50, top 100. I mean, we're just not it, it's not even near the 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 kind of like uh, scale that should warrant global attention. Obviously, the reason it actually does warrant global attention is not because of this deep-seated like uh, you know, uh, passion for the oppressed because there's many, many oppressed who go unheard all across the world. Mm-hmm. It's because it just so happens that these oppressed people, uh, you know, in, uh, they validate this narrative that they have about the state of the world, uh, who the bad guys are and who the good guys are, who is suffering at, you know, uh, at the boot of, of you know, which, which evil um you know manifested and it's just you know so that's one reason i didn't i don't pay attention the other reason is that as you said how do you if there if there is so much propaganda around this issue there's so much propaganda constantly and there's so much to know like so many details that people think are relevant that are just being thrown at you it's so hard as just like an individual like observer to really get at the truth of things I felt that given my inability to have a, you know, an extremely in-depth understanding of what was going on, which I think is necessary in order to have like, in order to be a political participant who is, you know, responsible, you really need to understand issues like in in great depth. And I found that just for anybody, not, not for me in particular, for anybody, this is a, this is a tough issue to get to you know like what well what what are the facts on the ground what is the truth and what is analysis and what is propaganda and what is spin and you know uh, can can we verify these videos can we verify these accounts you know there's so much there that it just felt to me that out of the things you know what's wrong with the world then what can i understand enough to even change or affect this is just not a this is not a conflict that lands at the top of either of those lists. Having said that, I'm not Israeli and I'm not Palestinian. So I think if you are either of those things, you have a personal connection to the conflict. You know, and I think that to some degree, Jews in general feel a personal connection to this conflict because they have ties to Israel. And it is this like homeland that that they can go back to if they ever feel unsafe in their own countries. So, you know, I excuse like the, the kind of dedicated attention to an issue that otherwise should should not warrant global attention from those parties. But then there's just this broader, like, I mean, it just, it, why does BLM care? Why does BLM know anything about, I mean, they don't. One, they don't know anything well, about it. I mean, but there's, it's, it, it, yeah. It's just because it's, it's, this is symbolic of their struggle of, and they feel it is symbolic of their struggle um, against oppressors everywhere specifically uh, white white oppressors or exactly. people who are I mean, white caste history of conflict between blacks and jews right is ex- but like it's amazing to me i guess it's not amazing but it should be that blm wants to even get in on this i mean i, I get i wonder how much they're even thinking it through because the fact is we live in the era of the land acknowledgement that's mm-hmm. what everything is so if anything can be traced back to your colonizer it comes down to colonizer bad, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. no matter what. And it's just an incredibly simplistic framing of everything. Such and the fact is, it's stupid. They don't, even I mean- if, right. The, and the thing is, here's the thing. Even if the political situation were absolutely like black and white, easy to understand, like, you know, Israeli-Palestinian conflict for dummies was like, you know, on everybody's coffee table, the atrocities committed... I just don't even see how you can react in any way other than emotionally and as a human being. As a human I, being. 
I don't, I, I, right. And I, you know, and I, I guess people say like, oh, well, you're upset because these are white people and you're relating to them. And these are young people at a, at a concert and, and, you know, we're, we're seeing them. You could say, well, look, I mean, the Rwandan genocide, you had neighbors attacking each other with machetes. That is horrific. Like, you know, I, I'm trying to think like that's actually the closest I can think. I mean, I know there have been all sorts of genocides. I mean, there's stuff like this. You can, it, all there's kinds of mob ways. violence like this all over yes. the world. Like, I mean, in Pakistan, it happens constantly. Like, well, you know, my mom tells me of stories of because we're we were Shia, um, which is like the minority of, of the two major Muslim um, sects. Shiism is the minority and it's a minority in most countries except iran and iraq where they have i think a majority in population but the sunnis tend to be in mm-hmm. power or were in power definitely um in saddam's era um and so there's 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 um my mom tells me stories of you know constantly like pe- people will just turn on you and there would be like a riot and then they would they would run you know there would be a mob that would form and they would go and break into the houses of Shias and attack them brutally. And she has stories of hiding in, in homes like of her oh. Sunni friends who would give them shelter, like protect them uh, when these sorts of things would happen. This is a, I mean, it's what it is, is a very, it's a very primitive kind of, it's a very third world way of relating to other people. It's just pure ethnic conflict. It is evil. You know, it is barbaric and it, that's an accurate way of of describing it it's not you know there, there's no racial connotations to it that's what that's what it is it harkens back to a time before we had uh, you know civilization and a, a society where we recognize that everyone in that society every citizen has a certain yeah ha, has a certain norms. claim to life yeah, yeah. Has, has a claim to life that cannot be superseded by you know one ethnic group deciding that they've been affronted or insulted in some way. And it's just that those are not the rules everywhere in the world. And they're not the rules in the Muslim world, unfortunately. And I think that that's something Israelis understand like deeply, you know, and Westerners do not understand. I would think that an event like this would help them understand it, like would help BLM, you know, cocooned in in chicago never having left chicago you know many of these activists they they don't know anything beyond like their city they don't know anything beyond you know uh, the the west and the protections of the west they have no idea what uh, the, the kind of horror that that israelis do know personally they do know closely you know it's so easy to to judge how extreme they are with their security measures and Mm -hmm. it seems like a weird like you know i so i visited israel um pre-pandemic uh it was kind of like a last hurrah before i got pregnant i was um going to lots of different places i did a long stay in europe and um, my husband and i decided that we were going to go visit israel and see the uh, dome of the rock um you know just like the standard jerusalem uh you know, interesting, like mm-hmm. whatever sites. Uh, it was weird. It was, I did not. Yeah, I've been to Israel too. I mean, it like, was, yeah. uh... I, I don't like the religiosity. I don't know why I signed up. I just wanted to see it once. The, I just wanted to see the Dome of the Rock. I just wanted to see it in person yeah. and I saw it. And I, I thought was... it was a, a good place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live there. Was, yeah, I didn't like find that. Jerusalem I thought, what, crazy, but. Fun to me. Well, I thought Jerusalem was beautiful. I mean, I, I thought. Um, they were nuts. But, Every, their people were just, I don't know. They were just, it, I, there were so many different religious groups doing so many weird things. Yeah. You know, I, I, I did. The, some Indian Christians mind. were doing all kinds of Christian. Stuff. Well, it was so Christian. It was so like, Christian. And we were there. Um, because it was right, it was right after Christmas. So there were these busloads of um, like Christian pilgrims from like the, uh, you know, this American South and the Midwest, and they were visiting Nazareth and Bethlehem, and they had their Bible study. And it was like, it was, it was the most, it was actually the most Christian place I've ever been. It was just religious. <laughs> it was just so religious. Yeah, but it was I, so yeah, religious. See, yeah, I thought it was, yeah. But Nothing you're right. Bo- it was Christian in a way that, that- it was a kind of Christianity that I don't think is all that common in America. 
it was like no. an international, like very like they were deeply committed. Rooted. Yeah, they I were it was, deeply I was, committed. I was impressed actually. I thought, okay, well, look, if you live in Alabama and you your church got its act together to charter, you know, get on a plane and fly over here and organize this tour, good for you. So. I saw some. I mean, I saw just weird. I don't know. It was kind of like it was really international. That was the other thing. Like yeah. it was just all these religious sects from all. I mean, I would talk to people like, "What are you know? What are who are you here with?" And if they could speak English, which wasn't always guaranteed, mm-hmm. um, they might tell me that you know they were from some Indian state and they were Christians, but like a very mm-hmm. specific kind of like form of Christian. I don't know. I mean, it was just there was so much. Um, and we did that walk, like the Jesus's, you know, passion, passion of the Christ. On the walk. water? Did you walk on the water? Like no, I didn't. Uh, uh, well, I do got to pay more. I do for that, that all. The, I do that all the time. I know um, that's just another the day but, in your life. Uh, it it was. It was. I I just didn't. I I don't react well to this to, to this whole thing. I mean, kind of as an observer, it was interesting, but it makes me uncomfortable. I liked Tel Aviv a lot. It was a very um, modern city. Uh, well, modern and then not modern, right? Like it was just like it. It, it was this it was weird very mix of like, yeah, yeah, it was it was a weird mix of like one street would be super western, or like one restaurant would be like the most hip. Like it, it was like something out of Brooklyn, and then just like a short drive away from there, you're in the third world. You know, you're in mm-hmm. <laughs> like you're in like there were there were the, you know the way that the, the lack of development. I'm familiar with it. I'm from Pakistan. Like I know what it looks like. Dirt roads and uh you know like uh, a kind of construction that's sort of common yeah uh when you don't have access to certain materials and it was it was really odd mix of that i i I found that part very interesting and i loved the food in tel aviv um Mm. i thought it was amazing did you visit any occupied territory or, or anything like that no, I mean we we were just gonna we were just in and out because it was the bucket list tour. So it was it was really yeah. we were there for Jerusalem, and then we just happened like we we landed in Tel Aviv, stayed there, went to Jerusalem, came back to Tel Aviv, and then flew out the next day. So even our um uh time in Tel Tel Aviv was very very short, and I wish it had been longer because I actually liked that, that part of it. I liked um it was it's a little odd to be like an obvious like like with a Muslim name and everything person mm, mm. hanging out in a super Jewish neighborhood. And they're all like looking at me oh, to make like, sure they know you're American. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it was interesting. So um, we went, I mean, I guess I went in 2010 um, or late, late, late. Yeah. I guess 20, 2010 or so. Um, and I went to Hebron. So um Actually, I went I, when was, this was when I was married, and uh, we had a friend who was um, old or Orthodox woman who I knew from New York, and she had a lot of family in Israel, and she was kind of taking us around, and um, we, we we saw a lot of the country, and we had a lot of different experiences, but we did go on this um, um, like peace, one of these like you know peace tours, one of these like uh, kind of the, the, the Jews, the pro Palestinian Jews, activist Jews, um, you know, they have these tours of occupied territory. So we went through Hebron and they showed us, we went into um, a mosque and they showed us like how difficult it was for the Palestinians and what the occupation was like. And obviously this is very, you know, compared to Gaza, this is a very sort of low level occupation. I mean, not low level, but it's, not as harsh um as other places i would not have i would not characterize this as an open air prison yeah so in hebron i remember there would be there was like a, the marketplace uh you know and you would go through and they had this like netting on top of the whole thing because you know there were israelis and palestinian you know, israelis were occupying this territory it was palestinian and and the, we, we were told is that Israelis were like throwing garbage and food and trash onto this marketplace and that they needed this netting to catch it. Anyway, that's what I don't that, believe that. I, I just, I, I mean, I I, I, there was netting with garbage on it. Okay. I'm not saying know. that, but I'm just saying that, that that very much could just be that if you have an open air market, like you might want to protect your produce, especially right. if you're not, not in a, a bad super idea, developed area actually. where it's, you know, when people throw trash out of like windows and st- that happens a lot. That happens. Like, I remember one of the things that I found insane about America was just how clean the streets were and how like, and this was, you know, I mean, we 
came into like most people we came in or the port we came into was through new york mm -hmm. and i remember thinking new york was so clean and i was just like wow like there's just no trash anywhere and one of the things my um cousins had to teach me was like we don't just the road like if you're done done with gum you don't just toss it on the street you wait mm -hmm. till you find a trash can and then you put it in a trash can yeah. or you don't just throw trash out of uh uh, a moving car like people would just you know just yeah. un, you know they used to do and that they, in that the was, 50s and 60s that, they, yeah they used to do that here too but they don't anymore definitely right. they still do that in the rest of the yeah. world so i mean any the whole netting thing i mean that but might you didn't have it in jerusalem but i mean you were not seeing it in other open air markets is what i'm saying in places okay in, in yeah Israel. maybe it so, could be i don't know i, I um, look i this uh, anyway the the it was um I, I'm really glad I, I went there. Obviously, I still understand very little of the whole thing, but um, it's. Uh, I, did you it, feel the, moved? Did you feel like this? Like, like, did you feel a, people like the guy, the tour we took? The guy was so like he had all this flowery language, and he was in Jerusalem, going through like the old city and the the Muslim part and the no, and he's like. The beauty of like, do you feel this? The the no. do you feel people? And I was like, I don't feel nothing. You know, one of the things I remembered, um, I, we were on. I think this was this Hebron tour. Uh, we were on a bus, and there was a family behind us. I don't know if they were American, but the it was a white American father, and the wife seemed to be Muslim, mm -hmm. and they had three little daughters, mm -hmm. and the oldest one was like in hijab, like a scarf. And then the little ones, like, and I, there was just a very strange, the way the father was talking to the mother, like there was a very strange dynamic, like almost like this father was fetishizing the, the Muslim mother and the whole thing. Anyway. Oh dude, white converts. Let me tell you, I can't exactly. even, I, I, I can't even start there. It's a, and, and it's totally different by gender. Like why men convert to Islam is always suspicious like it's always you know some kind of power fantasy dominance fantasy like the, the, the drive to be like a man again somewhere uh occasionally i have i knew one guy who like converted white guy who converted into islam through palestinian politics like he got so involved in the politics some and then somehow like that led to one thing led to another and then he was a muslim <laughs> um mm -hmm. and uh anyway the so that it, that that sort of thing happens too but often i find the the male converts very you know i don't know i i, I i'm i find them suspicious the female converts yeah. it's almost off almost like always a case of like liberals sympathizing with you know Muslims and the poor oppressed minority so much and then maybe falling in love with a guy. I think they fall in love with a guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when I, um, it was interesting. So uh, I was living, I lived in Lincoln, Nebraska for um, about three years. Uh, and I, that's actually where I was when 9-11 happened. And Lincoln, Nebraska is a huge refugee resettlement location. And so there were a lot of, um, there, there were a lot of Iraqi uh, uh, refugee asylum seekers and such. And, um, a lot of Syrians, a lot of Middle Easterns. And we also had a lot of, a lot of Somalians and others. And um, there were a, a, several white girls from the area who had fallen in love with these guys. They were fully covered. They, I mean, on, sometimes they were like, you could only see, they were like niqab, right? Like you could see their blue, little blue eyes, sticking out through everything else and it was like what is going on here mm -hmm. yeah uh so the female converts they will like it, it rarely they will do it sort of just on their own and then l less frequently they'll just do it because of this kind of weird bizarre liberal sympathy with um a very you know oppressed minority and then they I don't become, think they thought it through then they that become much. very liberal muslims but but for the most part i think it is it is romance related but then you know it, it, it is heartfelt you know they will convert but they will mean it it won't be just a joke they do you know change their minds and they do feel strongly about the religion and often you know many of those marriages don't last we, there's no way to have a number of how do they get divorced can they even I'm get talking, divorced 
I mean, if you're an American woman in America, you can do whatever you, you can do whatever you want if you decide to, you know, go outside of like the religious community, which is very easy if you you know have a community elsewhere. Um, but they, so they, you know, these women, they, they, even when they get divorced, sometimes they will remain Muslim, um, less Muslim, but, but sometimes it will still have, uh, they will still wear the hijabs or something. So I've, I've seen that. Um, and it's interesting with, with the men, it's very different. There will be some marriages like love marriages that happen. Um, if it, the reason I'm not counting them as a bigger, I would count them as a bigger slice if we could also include like these sham conversions, which is more or less what's going on. in like, you know, with, you know, Muslims, I know people who are, who've married into my family with the guys, mm. it's a, it's a sham. Con it's like, like he's Muslim now. And it's like, he's not. He's not oh, but he—but like, he it's just, not a sham marriage. He wants. It's to not a sham marry, marriage. It's a sham. He, yeah, just, he, 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 he wants it, to so marry it's a formality. this woman, and he right. has to pretend like he's Muslim. So that's what he tells our family, and you know, and we all just play along, pretending like he's actually done that. But you know, he, he's he's still whatever yeah. he was. Um, so that, that that's sort of the way it goes with with guys that they don't actually convert, even when they convert. Um, they often don't, don't marry for love as, as off, like, it's not as often as, um, uh, with the, with the sexes reversed because it is harder for Muslim women to meet guys and date guys. And, you know, then there's restrictions on, on sex that, that Muslim women are more likely to abide by. And so that, that sets a lot of barriers of dating outside of the religion for Muslim women right, that, right, right. you know, that, that doesn't exist the other way. Um, to the same degree anyway. Um, and, and so it just doesn't, uh, it, it, it doesn't happen that often. And it's interesting, but it, when you see a man who has converted truly, like he has converted on his own, it doesn't have to do with love. This is what he wants for his life. That guy is, you know, he's suspicious. He, mm -hmm. there's 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 a reason and yeah this is one. like next level manosphere yeah that's it's it's a manosphere reason like that's mm -hmm. what it is it's a it's mm -hmm. a it, you know maybe maybe it's just like harmless in the sense that he just needs to feel like he cares about something and he needs to have some kind of community that can happen that way but i i often find that there's a there's a scent of like misogyny around, you know. Well, they just, it's kind of like the MGTOWs. Like they just, they're tired of the white Western woman. Like they're not going to put up with that anymore. Right. Yeah. It's and like and that. Go, go to a place where they are respected. And, yes. You know, I, anyway, I find it to be really, um, really gross actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, but just ba back to the, the response here. I, I I mean, what do you make of all of these student organizations? I mean, Harvard. This was this list was going around. All these Muslim student associations and others. I think the Nepalis were um, on this list for a while, although they uh, they've left. They backpedaled. Um, I mean, like, what do you make of all these affinity groups? For starters, like, I did not realize there were this many, it, it, these are very thinly sliced categories. Why are they? I mean, why, why, I mean, I guess what, Harvard's very big and very involved, but this is ridiculous. I, yeah. I mean, so, I mean, the Muslim, the Harvard Muslim law school association, um, the, uh, sorry, I had this in front of me. So let me stop. I have it. Let me do. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. The uh, there's so many. The Harvard College, Pakistan Student Association, Divinity School Muslim Student Association, Har uh, Middle Eastern and North African Law Student Association, Graduate Students for Palestine Islamic Society Law School, Justice for Palestine. It just keeps going. Um, there's one Jewish group, uh, Harvard Jews for Liberation. There are you know, mm. Muslim women's groups. Uh, there are obviously like Pakistan is very involved. The Arab world is very involved. Then there you will have like groups like uh, Prison Divest Coalition, which. OK, OK. Um, Sikhs and Companions of Harvard undergraduates. Right. OK. Um, yeah. The George Washington University Students for Justice in Palestine put out a pretty extraordinary statement uh, supporting the uh, supporting supporting Palestine. And uh, you say we the, the GWU Students for Justice in Palestine stands in full support of the liberation of our homeland and our people's right to resist the violent 75 year long colonization of our homeland by any means necessary. 
Incredible. The Incredible. events are history in the making. They yeah. are, they mark the beginning of a new era in our struggle. I mean, these are American law students. Yeah. And they're saying, uh, you know, on the, the, the days after it happened, your know, bodies are not cold. Videos are just circulating. We're just understanding exactly the, you know, the extent of, of what happened. And their first response is Israel is to blame, which is to say Israel had deserves this. You know, this is exactly what was coming to them. And now it has come to them. And we are fully in support of, you know, Palestine struggle for justice with no, you know, I, I mean, it, the, the, the Harvard Palestine solidarity groups, you know, I maybe I'm not seeing the full full statement, but I don't see anything about actually condemning the violence. Which is incredible. The president finally did speak out. Uh, just of Harvard. Of Harvard, yeah. Uh, oh, on on wow. Tuesday, she said such inhuman uh, such inhumanity is abhorrent. Whatever one's individual views of the origins of longstanding conflicts in the region, uh, let me also state on this matter, as on others, that while our students have the right to speak for themselves, no student group, not even thirty student groups speaks for Harvard University or its leadership. Um, so that that's uh, Claudia Gay, who is the president of Harvard, who also happens to be the cousin of Roxanne Gay. Claudine Gay, excuse me. Claudine Gay really? is the Harvard president. Yes, she's Roxanne Gay's cousin. I think that this whole, um, she might say that this, you know, this Harvard statement might be that it, they don't represent us, but if you don't, if you don't go out of your way to say that this was the this is awful that we condemn it, we condemn that statement. Uh, not just they have they have their free speech and they have their rights to you know do what they want to do. Okay, sure, we knew that. Well, it, and that this is Hamas. It's a terror. It's, it's not a terrorist Palestinians. Group. A terrorist group, it's, uh, right? Murdered a bunch of civilians. Uh, how? I just uh, how hard is it to get to separate these two things? It is how not, hard there, is there that? There can't be a clearer line. There right. can't be a there can't be a more black and white scenario. And it is incredible that they seem to have they seem more confused by this situation than they would if the scale was less brutal. You know what I mean? Like there's something about yes. how awful it is that makes it simpler for them to to accept it as as justified retaliation. I and I wonder of, if that's like yes. a coping mechanism. It is, a, as like, you would say, it's a cope. Well, because this is the conspiracy theorist cope, right? I think people become conspiracy theorists because they are unable to deal with the fact that the world is chaotic. Yeah. And disorganized and there's yeah. not always a reason for everything and there's not somebody pulling the strings yeah. things just happen that we cannot control i think it's a control thing like the idea that something like this would happen for no reason or no good or reason, was unjustified it was just yes. an unjustified thing that is in intolerable actually it's, it's intolerable to their sense of selves also as like you know supporters of palestine so they have to actually double down they have to say that in fact it was just Otherwise, they would have to say that they are part of a group that is capable of and, and in just an incredible yeah. amount of cruelty to it's the sunk civilians, cost theory. to children, you know? Yeah. So they, ha they have to say, no, actually, it was totally deserved because, you know, Israel had it coming because it's been so uh, oppressive for so long. I think it is. You're right that it is. There's something psychological going on. However, that does not mean that is not to say that they don't actually believe it now. They do believe it. They have to believe it, you know, for their own, the more violence you excuse, the easier it is to excuse, you know, the, the next step, the easier it is to excuse the next level, the next inhumanity that comes your way. And so many of these pro-Palestine groups have, you know, they have opened the door for, for, for I think, you know, a, a kind of like immoral, like an immoral approach to politics that to me has fundamentally undermined my, my, my approach to them. You know, I no longer see them as the way that I did even like five days ago. And, you know, before this wasn't that well informed, had a lot of 
uh, had had a had a feeling that this was a very complex issue, and I had sympathy for Palestinians. You know, I had sympathy for Palestinians. I agreed with them that sometimes I still have sympathy for Palestinians. Well, I, I mean, mean, I do, but I also they're don't not know all Hamas. If they're being oppressed by Hamas, they have. To, but who is you know who's saying this? Who's saying they're not all Hamas? Or we are right. We are saying they're all not uh, all Hamas. Well, I would find that uh, hard to the, believe. The, but... the pro Palestinian groups are. So many of them refusing to make a distinction. Right. They are refusing to make it's a distinction. It's the groups. Right. I, right. But what does that mean? And how, who does that reflect? I also, do they reflect anybody on the ground? Or like I now yeah. I'm now I'm in this uncharted territory of not knowing, you know, like now, now that they I feel like have revealed themselves to to be capable of excusing a just black and white immoral immorality, what else are they capable of? You know, and I, I feel very I, now I feel confused in a way that I wasn't five days ago I you know five days was it five days I guess it was more than like a week ago but I felt you know sympathy for Palestine sympathy for the cause uh the feeling that you know Israel is is too callous and brutal in its implementation of its security measures although I understood like the logic behind it at the same time it felt to me to be a bit much um, uh, you know, that's uh, sort of a lightweight. I mean, it's not enough, but it's I, the but security I, measures. It's the it's the land grab. I mean, it's a whole bunch of things. It's and a whole Netanyahu's bunch of things. government certainly. Um, I mean, ugh, they are this far, is not. I mean, there's a lot of there's a anybody. far right, yeah, government, right. and so, there's there's a increasing you know growth of far right politics in Israel. I was troubled by that. Saw that as troubling. Would never think to be you know uh, you know. And, uh, my sympathies were mixed at best, but I was fairly warm mm -hmm. to to this the, the Palestinian Palestinian cause. Let's just let's just put it that way. Um, given that it is a complex situation um, that everybody's just seems mired in, but this, you know, yeah. At the very least, these the groups that organize in the name of Palestine, like who knows? It's a black box. What Palestinians actually think, right? Uh, who but but what I know what these groups think. You know, now I feel like I have seen the face of uh the the Palestinian uh organizing in yeah. in America, in the West, and I don't like it. I don't think they think I don't like any I don't know what they think. I I think that they are operating like under a set of very abstract principles that have to do with a sort of philosophical framework that has no bearing on any practical matter. I mean, it's it's like they haven't. It, this is an abstract ideology. It, it's they're really like re, they're being very re, like religious fanatics. They, I mean, it doesn't map. They're on dehumanizing Israelis. That's to what any, they're doing. Yeah. You know, well, and yes. Yeah. And but it's like, oh, this this group good, this group bad for all these reasons and power and decolonization and, 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 and decolonization and, and oppression and all yeah. There the, was yeah. A, I know. I want to read a little bit. So, um, Yael Bartur, um, who's a fr fr friend of good friend of my other pod, um, and is therefore a friend of this pod too. She co-hosts the Ask a Jew podcast with Hailea Suffren, um, which is a great podcast. Yael is Israeli. Uh, Hailea is an American uh, Orthodox uh, Jew. Um, they're both, Yael lives in New York most of the time, but is, was actually in Israel um, when this happened. And she's been uh, tweeting a lot and she has a great piece on their Substack. Um, I'm just going to read like a little bit from it. Uh, she says, by far the most loathsome type of person in this whole equation is the useful idiot. This is the same person that thinks words are violence, words are violence, but microaggressions are scarier than Hamas. They think silence is violence, but violence is necessary for, quote, liberation. They want to decolonize, yet can't point to Israel on the map. Yeah. They have an everyone is welcome here sign, but they oppose the Abraham Accords. The word normalization is triggering to them. They think arming terrorists is a human right, but arming police officers is genocide. They don't want to condemn the brutal massacre because they think Muslims support it, so they will be offended, which shows how truly racist they which shows how racist they truly are. Some of them may have even posted a blue square to Instagram when a homeless person in the East Village drew a half-assed swastika on a bus, but they pick and choose which anti-Semitism they quote stand against. Um yeah. I just I we live in an age of 
memes and images that people that have so little substance attached to them. Right. I, I, I it's, it, it really sort of just comes down to that. Everything is about style. Everything is about this kind of veneer of um, politics. That's really just sort of expressed through like, yeah fashion and slogans and it's political hobby illustrations yes right. it's political hobby yeah. it's and that's the that's that's the dominant religion of the of 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 young western people especially the elites um that 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 you approach the world in from the lens of these you know political theories that are very black and white, that are very, you know, I mean, not just black and white, sometimes just wrong, sometimes well, it's just, just stupid. Incredibly like, incredibly like, unsophisticated. It. Incre- yeah, just, just it's wrong. Juvenile. It's wrong. You know, yeah. it's, that, that's just not how, that's not how the world works. Stop using these buzzwords. And I, 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 every time I see, you know, you always, you can spot it. You can spot the social justice, like brainwashed, you know, two brain cells rubbing together. That's it. That, that, that that's uh you you can see that in the language you can see that language well it's zombie it's very zombie like language right right and it's 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 a cue that this person doesn't use their brain this they might not have a brain they might actually be dumb a lot of them are dumb but beyond that it's they've chosen to not think about issues critically they're they're teaching in universities they're teaching and and in high school i don't think people Uh, yeah i don't think people recognize how bad it is and i feel like one of the the I guess the black pills of this weekend to me has been that I didn't realize how bad it was. You know, I even you have just been well. It, it, I didn't. Well, I didn't specifically think this Palestinian cause was as dark as as it has. And it now seems to seems um, to me to be. And again, making a distinction between the people for whom I can't. I won't say one thing or another. I won't say they support it or they don't support it. I don't know what they support. I don't know who they are. I can't trust anybody's reporting on them. Because the reporting that I used to trust, the reporting I used to listen to, was the same people who are who are now saying that this was justified, or or that they, this was uh, uh, something Israel asked for, and you know, not in exactly those terms, but more or less implying that that is what that is what happened. Those are the people that I used to trust. They would tell me that Palestinians just want peace. Palestinians just want to live. Palestinians, do, you know, they just want to send their kids off to school. And I understand, of course, I'm a humanitarian. I have a bleeding heart. I understand all of that. And I it, it intuitively feel that to be true. And I want to believe that. But now I don't trust you. I don't trust you. I don't trust those people. I don't trust anything that they're going to say to me. They can say whatever they want tomorrow. And I'm going to say, I don't trust you. I don't know. I don't know. Like, my information doesn't get, like, the, w- w- what what my brain thinks is true isn't shifted at all by what they claim is true. And it, this puts Palestinians in a worse position. Of course it does, because I know I'm not alone here. I know there are many, many people who are thinking the same thing. There's they re, they were reaching out to me because I said on Twitter, I said that I feel like I'm being radicalized by all this. Like, mm-hmm. I just cannot believe the kind of inhumanity and cruelty that I'm seeing all around me and the excuses by the people who are not. They're not that inhumane. You know, they are saying they are saying I condemn the violence, but they're also you know, splain in a way these other groups instead of condemning them too for yeah. a, a, a really yeah, no, horrific I, response. I, I know. And I have been naive about the anti-Semitism. I have to admit. Um, I, I, I mean, I did not realize the extent of it. I uh, knew the anti-Semitism. I just didn't know that they had that, that West, you know, Western groups, you know, it's one thing to, mm-hmm. to, to recognize the existence of anti-Semitism in the third world, whatever, like in, you know, in the, in Muslim well, majority countries, like, like that exists, like a far right militia group springing up in the West. I mean, we can see that version. Yeah, of it, that exists, right? that yeah. exists, but there's th- the way that they were able to just say that they're th- it, it, to, to say that this is, this is a, just in any way to imply that there's a justice here um, to imply that this is part of a just struggle and this is just what we need to do to decolonize or whatever. That to me, it's just, uh, it's remarkable. It is beyond anti-Semitism. It is like, it, it is treating them uh, it, in a way that I thought we couldn't really do. You know what I mean? That 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 kids who grow up here, they've they've been inculcated with a very 
you know, delicate kind of liberal sensibility. They they don't they understand the, the the dignity of human beings and the right to life. Like these people who think everything should be a right. You know, they think they think. You, they, I think we've gotten to a place where where race uh, and power are the most important things. I mean, can, I also want to talk about an aspect here that I think it hasn't been really broached yet. Like, have we stopped caring about women? Have we stopped caring about oh, women when, when being When Israeli raped women get raped violated? and murdered, that's, I mean, yeah, but that's horrific. justice. Okay, that's but just... like, I feel like, I mean, because this is the same crowd that was yelling about, um, you know, women being safe from sexual assault on campuses and, um, you know, Me Too. And like, it's never been a more dangerous time to be a woman in, in the world. Like, this is the same crowd. And suddenly we are seeing right in front of our eyes images of women who've been brutally, brutally raped and then marched off to be tortured and then killed. Mm -hmm. And that's not that's just kind of beside the point. When did yeah. this happen? But it's they like will we, say I mean, they will say the reverse all the time. They will they will say that Israeli women can't be true feminists, you know, like or, or can't be part of the feminist movement. If you, you know, if you're Zionist, you can't be a feminist because Zionists want Palestinian women to be oppressed or something. Right. Right. So the logic, the inverse of that logic works. It works but when women applied have, to okay. but Israeli women don't. I mean, so what? <laughs> so so what? Uh, I, I think it's kind of a mask off moment for me. It's just this sense of like, well, these are just. These are just tribalists in the most despicable sense of the word. Mm -hmm. The their whole justice, da, da, these are all they mean nothing. These are you know these are just uh, performances that they're all putting on because this is the time. This is the time to drop a performance. Like if you really just if what you are is a humanitarian, deep in your soul, what you are is a humanitarian. For five for five minutes, you should have been able to empathize with the human beings who were targeted civilians who were mm -hmm. targeted deliberately by, by Hamas. And it just, it doesn't even, you know, I, I think that they would justify just about anything if it furthered their political goals, whatever they are. Right. And I don't understand how this furthers any political goal. That's what I don't understand. Well, I don't it's understand not, I mean, it's how... going to, it's going to backfire. But, this but is, what, I, it's not, maybe, maybe, well, but Megan, one way of looking about looking at it is that it's not going to backfire because it's not, they, their goal is not saving as many Gazan lives as possible. If there, if that was their goal, if the goal was to save as many Gazan lives as possible, would this be what they would, what what one that w would this be what Hamas would do if that this was Hamas's you know intention, and two would they do anything but condemn it and say and and you know if this was my goal if my goal was save as many Gazan lives as possible and I was a Palestine you know free Palestine kind of person, I would be doing everything in my power to beseech people you know and to to tell them that there's a difference huge difference between what Hamas is doing here, which is completely like it is unforgivable. And, you know, and, and there is no justification for this kind of horrific thing. It is, you know, it, we have reached a new level of inhumanity and it is not OK. And it is not the same as this struggle. It is not the same. That's what I would be doing. I would be saying it is not the same if my goal was to spare Gazans. That, if that was my goal. But the, the the second it happened, their instinct was to protest yeah, free Palestine, which which means in their mind it is this is this is part of the struggle. Mm -hmm. This is part of what happens. And some of them explicitly said exactly that. This is what decolonization looks like. Not enough people condemned, like not enough people on their side stopped them. You know, said what do you what what no, are they're you afraid. doing? I they, mean, they, you know, they're saying what? it silently. I, that's the thing. Like they're the customers. I feel like, yeah, these groups have become the customers of the universities. The universities won't step up. Larry, Larry Summers, I believe that was his name. He was the he was the president of Harvard who was like, you know, driven out decades ago because he was making noises about certain biological distinctions between men and women. He was making a, a, a subtle point that got completely misconstrued. So he's been demonized by the by the activist left, but he's, um, you know, is remains very much the face of Harvard. 
you know, did a very long and compelling tweet thread condemning uh, the Harvard administration for not stepping up sooner. And that resulted in this kind of, you know, milk toast statement from Claudine Gay. But it means nothing. That statement I, means nothing. I just, how did we nothing. leapfrog? We left, we, we went, it's like it was five years ago, everything was about women and women's safety and sexual violence and male violence and that power struggle. And it's like, we just like did a leapfrog over into everything being about skin color and some kind of abstract notion of power. Yeah. And not to mention it. like, the, I mean, the, 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 many Israelis are brown. You know, like they're not, yeah, well, they're not like, exactly. they're, but, they, I mean, I'm, they're not usually as dark as I am, but they're, they're not, they're, they're not obvious. They're not blue eyed, you know, blonde haired, like people, like that's not what's. No, sometimes but they, they represent I mean, sometimes they for this, just, Westerners. I mean, the fact, and I also want, I mean, it was also, you know, so strategic, like you go and descend upon a bunch of tattooed kids at a, they were, that was a concert for peace, apparently. I mean, it was, these were, these were activists themselves, right? I mean, that's, what's also amazing. The, the kids that were attacked at that concert were exactly the same social justice really, crowd really, I didn't, I don't that are these, stu- these are these groups here that are not condemning the violence. It's astonishing. It's, it's a form of self-hatred. It's just, it, it's just ex- an extreme kind of cruelty. And I think that they don't recognize, because oh, I remember when I, so when I tweeted about this, I got just like so much hate unbelievable amounts of hate from people who were just like but do you even know the history it's like it doesn't matter that doesn't matter do you understand that it doesn't matter the fact that you can't understand that it doesn't matter tells me that you were deeply immoral like you don't have you don't have a moral bone in your body and i don't trust you like, i don't trust you next time i see a you know palestine you know free palestine flag somewhere if i see that in your bio i'm not working with you i'm making sure no one else works like what are you t- of course i'm going to get away from you because I don't trust you as a, you know, a moral actor. There's, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what Israel did. It does not justify beheading babies or whatever, yeah. like, you know, kidnapping know. Well, children. And now that maybe, home. I know, you again, can't? and now it's like, well, maybe the babies weren't beheaded. Maybe that whatever, was but like, disinformation. Guess what? It doesn't matter. They were killed. What does it matter? They were killed. They were killed. P- p- people's homes. Like, I could only think about, you know, how horrifying it must have been as a parent, as a, you know, it's to have soldiers break into your home, like kidnap your, you know, your your family, hurt them, like in front of your face, you know, to, to, to see them hurt like that. Come on. Like it's, you don't need to, you don't, you can be, you can be a hundred percent pro Palestine, pro freeing Palestine, even Mm -hmm. like, Oh, you can do the, 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 from the, whatever to the sea, what you can do. You can be that guy. You could think that Israel should cease to exist. You could be anti-Zion and still still human. Still find that this was an act of barbarism that has no excuse. You could still do that. I don't know. That's my problem. My problem is I don't see any, anything about their politics that should prevent them from fully, fully, you know, condemning this in every sense, distancing them, themselves from it in mm-hmm. every sense, they are doing the opposite. They're doing the exact opposite of what you would expect Yeah, you know, them to do if they really felt that this was not in line with what they saw as their, you know, justice like cause. So of course, you know what? Like, I'm sorry, I don't owe you support. I don't owe you, you know, sympathy. I don't owe you, you know, I, I don't, I, I, None of that is owed to you. The point of a political activist, if you are who you claim you to be, if you if you do, do want to solve this, you know, the, the issues facing this group of people that you feel so so much empathy towards, if you have these political goals that you claim that you have, you need to care about what I think. You know, you need to you need to not alienate me so much. I mean, just just from the pure from a purely political point of view, it baffles me that they would, this is a position that they would take. Um, not just because it is, th- there's an element of it that's stupid, but I think I, f- I fear that it's not stupid. You know, I fear that they are actually flexing their muscles and that in the, in the short run, it will disgust a few people like me and have us spin off, you know, but it, it sends a broader message of, of we are in charge now. And when we say 
this is a just cause. Everything is on the table. Okay, so this is where you and I part ways, and I hope that I'm right. I see this as the last gasps of wokeness. That is my Pollyanna view. Because there are a whole lot of people who have just been going along with the program and not thinking about this too hard and living their lives and being on the left and assuming they're on the left and assuming just that they agree with every box that gets checked on the progressive far left. A lot of them are Jewish. I know a lot of people like this. Mm -hmm. I find it hard to believe that this is not going to be a wake-up call. And It's going to be a wake-up call to some of them. Eh, but like in a pretty big way because who are, who is they i mean these you can talk about these student activists and you can talk about these generational cohorts coming up but at the end of the day it's there are donors th- these are university donors it's the donor class it is people who do not support this nonsense who are frankly are too intelligent have more important things to do i, I feel like this is going to burn itself out they here's why i disagree and i i hope you're again i hope you're right like if i had if I could make what you say, you know, if I, if I could, if I could help your cause <laughs> I, and I, mm-hmm. I'm trying, right. I, I hope that it's true. I hope that enough people wake up. Um, but here's the thing, like if waking up a small portion is not enough, especially if that small portion is not uh, capable of understanding or even willing to understand how we got to this point and able to say no to the whole thing. You know, not able to say no to the final end product of a, you know, of a logical series of of escalations, not to say, and no, 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 not here. Not right. Th- this is now where, this you've is gone too stop. far. Like, mm-hmm. no, no, don't say now you've gone too far. It was wrong in the first place. That first step was wrong. You know, that first, that first Which is what we've been screaming about for 10 years. I mean, this right. is what also drives me crazy is that I've been yelling about this for, I mean, I've been yelling about it full time for at least eight years and I've been yeah. yelling about it three quarters of the time for 30 years. So I, I, I just, I can't, I can't, it, but like the, how many, does it need to be everybody or like, does it just need to be the gatekeepers, the few, the, the few a, influential people. Whoever, if it's, even if it is 5% of the faculty at, you know, Harvard University that decides to say, we will say no to every, like, we we have to stop, the diversity statements have got to go, the DEI pledges, all these things, they have got to go, 100% of them. Not some of them, not a few, all of them, because that is not the mission of the university. You have to, because the second you start making these compromises, you make another compromise, then you make another compromise, and none of them seem so bad at the time. Mm -hmm. They might even seem good at the time. You know, they might seem even good at the time, and it might be very easy for you to be emotionally manipulated into taking those acts. And then 10 years later, you, you, you know, give rise to this monster that you cannot control because you have given up your tools to control it. You know, you have said in an academic institution that academics, that truth seeking is not the most important thing. If you've said that, well, now what? Now it's justice. And what they say is justice is justice. Not what you say, you know, white man. It's not (laughs) even, uh, it's not, I mean, the other thing I think people forget is it's not just like higher education. It's everywhere. I was just talking with somebody who is um, a teacher in, um, I'm not going to say where, but a urban uh, inner city, uh, you know, works, works at a inner city high school in a, in a blue city in a very, you know, urban, urban neighborhood in a blue state, tough neighborhood. Let's just put it that way. Um, Most of the students are black. uh, And I mean, this particular teacher had been very active in trying to, you know, help the students during COVID. I mean, there were like terrible things happening. Like the schools were closing down. These kids were literally getting shot outside of the school because they had to wait till a certain time to even come in in the morning. I mean, it was, it was unreal. I mean, the amount of damage that was done by this school system in the name of protecting people from COVID, I don't know what, um, is just, that's a whole other conversation, but, and, and this, this teacher had been, you know, one of the few that was really speaking out against the other teachers and trying to help the kids just totally devoted to these kids. They loved her she was saying that over the weekend, she's seeing them posting pro-Palestinian things, anti-Israel things. And these are like 17-year-olds yep. who have been taught this stuff 
by their public no other... school teachers, by the public school teachers that were happy to let school just come to a halt for two years. Right. And, well, uh, it's <laughs> that's why it, ma- it matters. It matters what like academia thinks because not because they actually matter, you know, and they don't actually pull any levels levers of power directly, but because they do inculcate, you know, a sense of this is the right thing for, I mean, just the education school, you know, just ed school, mm-hmm. ed schools are just hives of the most insane social justice, like worldview around. I mean, they're, and, and they're, they're stupid. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to any masters of education. Don't, I'm not getting, this. I'm not, not stepping personal, my toe not in, you. The P, in the P, I'm not going to get into another PhD Twitter it's, gate. It's, it's, it's not you, but it, it, it is your school and there's just not, it, there's, it's so bad. And of course that, you know, now that we have, we require teachers to often have all these degrees at the very least a master's or at the very least a bachelor's. And then uh, de- depending on the role, sometimes uh, uh, another credential on top of that, that's putting them through these like, you know, boot camps, <laughs> you know, it's putting them through like social justice. Oh yeah, no, it's a, like, it's woke a re-education university. camp. They should call it and re-education then they go and steal, school. Yeah, right. They, they, they then go the and school. teach our schools, t- teach our, teach our students. So that's why it matters. That's why it matters that we tackle academia as a specific, like a, as an originator of a lot of these, of a lot of these problems or find a way to take power from it altogether, you know, find a way to, to 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 credential people to give people credentials that will work in you know it, 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 it like actually work you know not work in in small percentage of the cases but but actually allow people to be employed yeah. like oh, there needs give to people be alternatives new there need to be innovative ways but uh, but don't you think i mean look what's happening in all these liberal cities they are breaking down nice liberals who supported all this stuff without thinking about it for decades are getting sick of homeless people ODing in front of their apartment buildings. They're okay. tired of it. They're tired. They're, you know, they are voting out the, the, you know, local, you know, politicians and like the municipalities, it's going to start to change. People yeah. can't I hope so. take it anymore. I and hope so, so this is just another, I think, you know, leg on that stool. Yeah. And it's, it's horrifying that it has to be, you know, Israelis slaughtered, and people dying on the streets for people to get wise and just see basic logic and common sense. But I have to think that yeah, something is going to give. I think that it's one is that the, the the few that are waking up have to recognize they're small, and so that they have they have to act almost radically. Like they have to accept zero compromises, you know, do what the, be the NRA. I don't do what the NRA does, but I don't think they're small. They're small to the extent that they, their small amount of people are going to speak out. I think that out of the, the base of sympathy is much larger, but the small amount of people who are disagreeable enough to do something about it is, it it is small and, and, and they have to, they have to be immovable. You know what I mean? Like they have, because they are setting the standard. If they do not, you know, there's this idea of, of um you know progress as being uh like moving the overton window is something that happens like right. incrementally um it is almost to th- that's not going to be a model that's possible for us what we need to do is something a little bit more radical than that and say this is the thing that caused you know the beginning of the rot and we have to say no to it so i use the example of dei statements because it's one of those it's one of those things that when you're talking about it you just seem like you know you just hate woke so much and such a stupid thing yeah. to worry about just sign yeah. the statement what are you a racist right you know? right why do like, you have it's to die so, this why do you have to why don't die is this the hill that you're gonna die on that's the kind of thing that they tell you because they're a fucking moron I, I, i'm gonna they're buy a cemetery plot on a on a no, hill they, right now because they, 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 they don't they don't recognize the they don't recognize that you are undermining a principle it's not about the statement. It's yeah. about, you know, we, we can all be, you know, I hope we are all at the very least, we are not racist, you know, but hopefully like we are, we are more than that. We are people who want to see less racism in the world. I hope that that is true. But once you insert something like that into, you know, your, your, th- this is what the university thinks and this is what the university feels and this is what the university accepts of its members, you are undermining your mission. 
that is super dangerous. It doesn't matter if it's a very innocuous thing. In fact, it's more dangerous if it's an innocuous thing because dumb liberals are going to say, oh, why not? Of course, I'm not an anti-racist or I'm, I'm not a racist. I would never, I wouldn't, I, I support everybody. You know, my, my grandson is genderqueer and they just, but it's like, you gotta, you know, like, so you have to stand up. You have to stand up the way the NRA stands up. They stand. They understand the. They understand the right that they're standing up for. They understand it deeply. They understand why it matters. They think that it matters, and they are willing to accept no compromise. So they they have no nuance. So they you're have zero against nuance. nuance in this case. I'm against nuance when it comes to principle. Mm. Like sorry, like well... there's, there's, there's no nuance when it comes to principle. You either have, you were either honest or you're not honest, right? Like I mean. But I think so, nuance has to do with the way you talk about something. I think you can be uncompromising on principle, but I think it's crucial to have a sure. nuanced discussion because you are going about to alienate all, different... all kinds of people. You got to be strategic. We can be, we, I mean, sure. I, I'm pro sneaky strategy, whatever, nice words to calm people down and make them not so fearful. But at the same, what I'm pro is that that we, we, we need to have a, a you know, a truly, a deeply held set of, you know, foundational principles that we will not, we will not abandon. We refuse to abandon. We don't abandon it for a bad reason, but we don't even abandon it for a good reason, right? Like even another cause, like, okay, you know, me too was very, I, I agree that there needs to be more accountability when it comes to sexual misconduct. And it would be nice to live in a world where there was no sexual misconduct or very little sexual misconduct. I want that world too. I, do, I also don't like it when creepy men do creepy things to me. At the same time, I'm not going to abandon due process at the altar of, of me too. I'm not going to do that because I'm not an idiot. Right. You know, I understand that due process is very important and it's, in a, it's a foundational principle. You know, due process is a foundational principle. You can't give it up, you know, because once you, once you lose that, you will lose the ability to fight for anything else that you care about. And that is what we're seeing happening. We're losing the ability to even have the kinds of discussions. I know. I you know, know. That would, That's that would, why we're here. I yeah, know. It, that would lead to the kind of outcomes that these, you know, nice, like soft, you know, hearted and, and brained liberals, like the, yeah. the kinds of things that they want to, uh, the, the kind of world that they want to see, you know, this, it's going to make it harder to fight for that world. We're already there. Um, so I think at some point, just stop. But, how do you, but, but you're not suggesting joining the other side. I mean, to, not to switch. No, I don't you think know, you need to area, politically like, be. You don't have to go to the Matt Walsh side. No, it, this is this has nothing the Chris to do with Chris Rufo side. Stay outside right, of but, politics altogether. Forget about right. Don't use, don't say Republican, don't say Democrat. You don't need, you don't, yeah. there are so many ways of approaching this that have absolutely nothing to do with yeah. who you vote for. You know, even even to the extent of you know, when it comes to free speech, support an actual free speech organization, support fire. You know, and if you were if you were if you're someone who is in a I position where you I can support fire. I thought they were us covert, covert right wingers. Right. I mean, Sarah. there's always going to be there's always going to be smear. They're but red. You have to fire be able... is red. It's coded. It's red. Their logo is red. That's what I'm saying. Certainly walk away from the ACLU, certainly walk away from yeah. institutions who, that are undermining the principles that you care about. If you are, you know, an academic, form organizations of your own, stand up for things, win followers. They're starting you know, be a to. They're, but, they're starting to. You know, the Heterodox Academy, um, they're, people are, they're forming chapters. I just ran into somebody the other day who's forming the Heterodox chapter on her uh, big state university in a, in a very... Um, in an unlikely place, actually. So I think it is starting to happen. I just, I know you're you're more pessimistic than I am because the the fact is that like we are in the majority, and I think you're right that That's it's hard never to speak change up. anything though. You know what I mean? Like well, majorities but, get overruled. I, I agree with you. I hope, like in the sense that I, I I hope we're we're the railing majority. against a stupid vocal minority of people that is being amplified by all kinds of dumb cultural forces like social media and influencers and memes. And I think that it's a sickness that almost everybody can identify by now. Uh, yeah. I, I think we're going to look back on this time in history as like a total bananas shit show. Uh, and, Megan. you know, I it's, hope you're right. I, I hope you're right. I, I think even if it gets better, it would be in the short term only because we are not undoing the logic. 
what we need to do is to overthrow the logic upon which their demands rest. And that is not something I see enough people willing to do or even willing to understand that 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 is how far back it goes and that is what you must do. Um, I There's just not enough I mean, of that, you know? Look I, what just happened. We just got done talking about Coleman Hughes and his colorblindness TED Talk. I mean, exactly the, exactly the kind of logic that we think should be the, the default setting of mm-hmm. everyone's sensibility. Like that, that's just basic logic. If, you know, we should go back to what he was saying. And, the, and there was a little uproar about it. But the fact is that like the vast majority of people think what he said is completely fine and logical and, and they would agree. But that wasn't, and, it doesn't change it because here's, so here's what it is. It's, it's more than just people believing certain things. It is that there are overlap there there are there are many different structural ways in which we have reinforced not Coleman's view but the people who oppose him yeah but but the ted ted has egg on its face that was a that was a an l i mean and they need bad. ted is going to take the l ted doesn't matter with anymore. that ted is going to die exactly it doesn't matter or, and another something else is going to take its place and it's gonna be worse and it won't care about egg on i face. think something i mean the thing is that like ted is from an era where it, it, it just was able to take up more bandwidth there were fewer competitors it was take it, it was it's like npr npr mm. doesn't matter nearly as much as it used to these because used to be these social justice groups have instead like now, now it's like the, 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 nobody Nobody reads the NPR because it's or, or, or uh, listens to NPR uh, um, or watches TED Talks because they've been replaced by something more nefarious. It's not. I don't think that. But you you're know, also gone saying away. that they've been infiltrated by these ideologues. So and 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 in so doing, they have sort of they have like both warmed yeah. its way out of existence. Well, I, I think I people think, don't, they think, have destroyed these institutions from I, the I inside. That, right. They have. And I agree with you that there are some people in the, in those organizations who are now recognizing as their organizations are dead or dying that, uh Oh, like this is really bad. This is really bad. They're finally seeing it, but it's too late. I just think that we are seeing across any number of metrics and across many different you know, pieces of human life in the West, people are starting to get fed up with this. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it has, something's going to have to break. It's not going to happen all at once and it's not going to happen overnight, but we wouldn't even be having these conversations like five years ago. Maybe. We we would be, you and me. Yeah. yeah. But um, there are a whole lot of people starting to talk about it. There are a whole lot of people starting to talk about it that wouldn't even have occurred to them a few years ago. Well, to be honest, even five five years ago, I would not have known to have looked this far back in our, you know, because I did not, I did not know how deeply rooted some of these problems. It is not, you know, some, some, you know no, college it kids this, overreacting no. it's no, it has it been something that we have yes. yeah a long time ago we have we have laid the seed you know like sown the seeds I mean, of what would eventually become yes, this movement the same thing i mean look the fact that um and i know we have to wrap up but the fact that people are starting to talk about um the sexual revolution the way they are the trad movement th- this is all of a piece yeah. people are revisiting these liberal paradigms that we've just b- taken for granted oh the sexual revolution the you know second wave feminism um good in every possible way well no in fact it's not Th- does that mean we need to get rid of it no but i think it's very much worth reexamining based on what we are now seeing about lots of unintended consequences. I, I, I think that it's, look, it's been 50 years since the women's, the second wave women's movement. It's, it hasn't been very long. Um, and same thing with civil rights and same mm-hmm. thing with, um, you know, certainly multiculturalism is like, what did we start talking about that in earnest in a mainstream way? What, 30 years ago? Like, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I hope that it is something you know, with the sexual revolution, I'm I'm more positive. But you know, on the whole, I am feeling as if uh, we, it is possible for us to backtrack and to get back to, uh, you know, a kind of a more liberal understanding of the world. Mm-hmm. I don't know how much more I have to say to, about this, other than I feel like, you know, it's not. I hope we stop sneezing at it. You know, or just just thinking that it's just this this temporary thing this fever that 
it just needs to we just need to shake it off and then we'll just wake up right it's um, an over it's an overcorrection i hear it's, that yes a lot. It's yeah overcorrection yeah. and why are you why are you yelling about this aren't there more important things yeah yeah it's, i think it's what, not a, it's not an overcorrection we actually and, did something bad right and people need to understand that yes there are more important things and those things directly link back to what we're talking about right yeah, yeah. so i we we shall see We'll, we'll we'll sit here uh, a year from now and see. A year from now, it has to be twenty years from now that we'll I see. Know. And I think that you know, um, think how many paying subscribers we'll have in if, twenty years from now. Oh my god, we're gonna we're losing them, even as we, as speak, we speak. Because I know that I, uh, my my new Zionist affiliation. It's so it's so messed up that people are like you're an, you're a Zionist now. And I was like, what are you talking about? All I said was it's inhumane to say this. Like it's inhumane to excuse. Like, well, maybe that's know, what Zionist means up. now. Like, is that what Zionism means? That, if fine, that is what it means, me okay, yeah, sure, I'm a Zionist. What are you talking about? What, what? Like, how can how can I be painted as an extremist for just this one, you know? And then that in itself radicalizes you. You know what I mean? Then then you start thinking, you know, right, okay. But then you're, but then okay. you don't want to, you don't want to construct your entire political Identity worldview on... based on feeling like, a, feeling grievance sure. at, at those who have, uh, demonized sure. you but it does I mean, we see people who built their think, careers around that right right i think that there's a way to just lose your principles entirely i don't think we've done that um or i feel like i up until more recently when i start what it what it did provoke in me here's a seed um that uh, you know of truth here which is that it did push me to reinvestigate certain things that I took for granted, you know, like seeing the kind of a kind of inhumane cruelty on one side does motivate people to re reinvestigate whatever principle it was that they felt so, you know, they, they felt like was so important to them or whatever understanding of the world that they thought was definitely true. Something like this makes me think maybe what I thought it was true about the world isn't true. You know, and now I have to now I will re like reexamine what I took to be the truth, which was actually something that was very sympathetic to the kinds of people who are now calling me a Zionist. You know, like it's it just it's incredible. Like it's it's it, and then there's oh well, you were a Zionist all along. You were a Nazi all along, and that's why. What does you, these you things know, even what? mean? What does that mean? I mean, these are these are people who are marching around with signs that say "queers for Palestine." Yeah, Can these you, are not the serious stupidity, people. The stupidity. I would th love that, that alone. That they, alone. I, I, Why don't you go to Palestine? <laughs> Let's see what happens to you when you go to Palestine. When you like, are queer in Palestine. I mean, that unbelievable. I yeah. Those kids need to be like. I mean, they need to be bullied or something because that's un. That I'd like is to crazy. know how. I wonder. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, I'd like to know how much of that was really going on. There was one. There were a couple images floating around, but that that is a level of stupidity that. It's stupidity. Surprises me. It's even so this offensive crowd. to people who are actually in those countries who yes. are getting who are being killed. It is so offensive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They, you know, and it, I, yes. I've had tons of conversations about this with gay ex-Muslims who are just like, "What? Like, wh what are you? What are you talking? You have no idea what oppression looks like." You know, and there are so many people, young young people, teenagers who don't know what oppression looks like. They don't know what, you know anti-gay they don't they don't know a time before you know love is love like before this yeah. this before marriage equality they don't remember that time they don't know they don't think of it as a real as a real uh you know uh environment for anybody but obviously that no, really it's, exists it's fashion it's fashion i mean it's it's the amnesty the international t-shirt that's... By the most privileged people around, mm -hmm. you know, the most privileged people around. Um, it's disgusting. It disgusts me. I just, I'm so appalled. I feel, I do feel radicalized by this weekend. I do. I feel like I, um, well, if, I'm emotionally uh, affected in a way that I haven't yeah. been before. I mean, yeah, we were talking about the uh, phrase, the cruelty is the point and how that's just been right. misused, um, you know, in, in on the political landscape. Uh, and in this case, the cruelty was the point. Yeah. This is an example of the cruelty being the point. And it, anybody who can't see that is just willfully 
not even blind. I just don't even, I don't even have the you, words. You've for lost it. A, you, you've lost. Yeah. Your you've lost, you you've lost the plot. Maybe you never had it, but yeah. Um, but, uh, I think, I think that we're going to see, um, a lot of discussion and, uh, some of it's going to be productive. All right. I think. Sorry. Okay. I'm such an optimist. Okay. I'm such it's, a, I know, no, it, I, I do Pollyanna. appreciate it. I'm just I do a polyamory. I was just about to say <laughs> I'm, I'm Pollyanna. a Pollyanna. <laughs> no, maybe, maybe not. Maybe you are right. And maybe, you know, uh, maybe I've too much of a, of a pessimistic view. And it's only been because, you know, I know what I know. I know my, the last 10 years, but I don't know the future. I can't predict what's going to happen um, or how it's going. History surprises us all the time. Um, you know, the way that events come together surprises us all the time. I hope I'm surprised in a good way. Yeah. Um, and then you get to lord it over me. Which would be I'll, I'll, I'll be, I'll I'll be dead by then. I'll, 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 I'll be dead by then. You're going to be the one who okay. enjoys it. So, um, okay. What do we need to know? We're having a, a hangout for our founding members this coming Sunday, Sunday. October 15th at 7 30 PM Eastern time. Mm -hmm. And you have to be a founding member. Yep. Yep. And us. again, we're releasing full, episodes for paying subscribers now we're not doing like the bonus at the end kind of thing we're just we're doing our own separate episodes so if you don't you don't want to miss them because they're they're good no we're really working our asses off for you guys yeah so you should you owe us this they do they definitely um, do i mean we're gonna... loading for so long you yeah. really should just feel a little guilty about it yeah um yeah, um, well, check it out. A special place dot substack dot com. That's how you can subscribe. Six dollars a month, or sixty dollars a year. Mm -hmm. Or they can and, watch on YouTube. Or they can watch us on YouTube. Um, and soon we'll have a Patreon up and running, so you'll be able to subscribe that way as well. But don't wait for it. No. Go to the Substack and do it now. Yeah. Uh, because Megan needs to, you know, pay her rent. I, I need to go get a haircut, obviously. No. Do you it's think I need it? I haven't gotten a haircut in months. I think my hair really? is, it's getting it's getting so I bad it's nice. that it's better. Yeah, yeah. it's one of those I, like so bad it's good. Okay. It'll, yeah, it looks good. Like, I like it. It's uh, you know, whatever. All right. Have well, a good one. See you next time. Bye. Night.